Hello, everybody. I'm Jamie from Black Kraken Canine, and I'm here with my very good friend, my business partner, co-owner of Black Kraken Canine, and someone I'm extremely lucky to have the opportunity to learn from every day, Dr. Stephanie Ucotti. Um, Stephanie holds a Bachelor of Science in Animal Behavior from the University of Toronto, a Master's of Science in Animal Behavior from the University of Guelph, and a PhD in Animal Behavior and Welfare from the University of Guelph. She then went on to do postdoctoral work at Guelph, including teaching classes in the Animal Behavior Graduate Program. And today, in addition to being a professional dog trainer whose work can be found all over our Instagram page, she works as a behavior and welfare scientist in the agricultural industry, consulting with farmers and slaughterhouses on how best to optimize animal health and functional performance in the most ethical and humane way possible. She is an internationally re renowned expert in animal welfare and behavior and is sought out by companies and organizations around the world for her guidance on the subject. Stephanie, that might be the nicest thing I've ever said about you. Probably, yes. <laughs> All right, good morning. Uh, is that Sunday. is that a pretty good uh, summation of your educational background? Yeah, 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 totally. So look, um, before we jump right into everything, uh, let me just set the stage for why we're here. And then, you know, I'm going to shut up and let you do most of the talking. Recently, the topic of the use of aversives in dog training has come to the forefront on social media. Uh, it was kicked off by a change in position of the American Veterinary, American Veterinary Society on of Animal Behavior, AVASAP, which now holds that positive punishment is never necessary in dog training. Naturally, a whole bunch of dog trainers jumped into the mix, but the majority of the debate has gone on between Robert Cabral on the balanced side, uh, Ivan Balabanov, uh, he didn't really participate in the debate so much as just said like, this is my position, take it or leave it, which I have a lot of respect for. And on the other side of the debate is a guy named Zach George, who is uh, a big name in the pure positive force free dog training movement. So look, throughout this conversation, we're going to pick on Zach George, but I want to be clear. This is not Zach George specific. This is a discussion that's going on in the dog world right now. We're seeing tool bans happening all around the world. Um, it just so happens that Zach George is an excellent representative of his side of the argument. Uh, as much as I don't agree with him, uh, he presents his side of the argument very effectively, convincingly, and uh, he has a large online following, which right there is the reason that I think it's incumbent on us to strongly refute the things that he's saying and to explain to anyone who might agree with him, but still be willing to listen to another side exactly what mistakes he's making in arriving at his conclusions. You know, he claims to have science on his side and that the burden of proof rests on anyone who disagrees with him. Uh, and as this debate was starting to rage, I thought to myself, you know, if only there were someone I could talk to who could give us a scientist perspective on this whole discussion. <laughs> and, uh, and here we are in the flesh talking to a real live scientist. Um, so look, before we get into the debate itself, quickly just walk us through your uh, body of research and your professional body of work. Help us understand how your experience is relevant to the current debate. Okay, so let's start off by just saying I'm an animal behavior and welfare scientist. So my actual profession on a day-to-day -day basis is how to make the quality of life better for animals, right? We love animals, that's why we're in, in, in this industry. So how do we um, improve the quality of life? How do we decrease unnecessary um, stress and distress? And, and just how do we make things the best that it can be in the most ethical manner for the animals uh, that we use and that are under our care, right? Um, and I've done this with farmers, on you know the best way to operate um, handling at a farm level worked a lot of years in slaughterhouses and trained slaughterhouse operatives on the best way to kill animals there are actually scientifically better ways to do certain things right um and uh you know i've, I've spent about 15 years just doing these types of things on on how to best 
um, achieve animal performance in a way that makes sense uh, for people to achieve what their goals are, but also in the most ethical uh, manner uh, for, the, for the animals, if that makes sense. Sure. So, so what about, um, I mean, we've, we've mentioned you're a dog trainer. I know you have experience training a whole bunch of different kinds of animals. Can you give us an idea of some of your training background? <laughs> fish, right? Fish. I actually, my dissertation was actually to look at and investigate fear, aversion. So there's that word aversives in cognitive capacity in an animal like a domestic rainbow trout. And what I can say is a lot of the learning theory and the concepts that apply um, to something even like a trout, you know, a fish is kind of like universal learning theory that applies to both like people and dogs. So it was really, really interesting um, to do that, that kind of work. I want to just uh, get some definitions out of the way here. What is a behaviorist? What is the difference between a behaviorist like yourself, who has spent 11 and a half some years studying nothing but animal behavior, um, and a veterinary behaviorist or a pet behaviorist? Okay, that's a really, really good question. I'm all about definitions because if we don't agree on definitions and roles, then everything falls apart, right? This is going to give us some clarity. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between veterinarians, veterinary behaviorists, behavioral scientists, and like pet dog behaviorists. So veterinarians, we're all familiar with veterinarians, right? They're medical doctors that work with animals. Their primary uh, profession deals with dealing with diseases and health um, of the animal, right? Their, their days are spent trying to treat all sorts of weird and wacky diseases, maybe removing an intestinal occlusion because your dog ate a sock, <laughs> you know. Um, never happens. Doing, <laughs> never happens, Juno. Um, spays <laughs> and neuters, you know, vaccinations. They want to make sure that our, our animals are healthy. Then there's uh, a few vets that are veterinary behaviorists, um, and they are veterinarians that have some extra training with some behavioral courses in there. So they're better um, equipped to deal with uh, some, you know, some more of the simple behavioral problems. Okay, but they're trained as veterinarians primarily. So for health of the animals. Then there's behavioral scientists. Um, and those people are a little bit different in that we're trained in the scientific method. Um, so or train you in would be a behavioral scientist. Just yeah. To be, so talking yeah. About you now. Yeah. Not a vet. Um, so we're trained in the scientific method. We're trained in experimental design. So that's huge, which means how to collect data, how to mathematically and statistically analyze like large data sets, for example, uh, and how to interpret those results in a meaningful way. So we're there to actually take a hypothesis. Um, something that we want to further investigate, and then we design experiments, um, and then we try to find some answers and some facts. So if I could just draw a, a bit of a delineation there from what I'm hearing. Um, I, I would imagine that a vet is also trained in the scientific method in the sense that mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they went to school to become a vet. They're familiar with the scientific mm -hmm. method. Um, I guess the major difference there that I can see is um, you're average vet who's not a research scientist is not trained in actually designing the the, the studies designing the studies is uh, is critical here um, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about why that's so important okay so why don't we why don't we back up here and hate to talk about you know Zach but this is exactly what he was talking about was that he was claiming that the you know the highest levels of academia and the, you know what, I have the, the quote, whole scientific cons okay I go ahead yeah, right yeah, yeah. let me let me just I'll, I'll read it right out so sure. scientifically speaking there is no known instance in the animal kingdom where positive punishment is required in order to create new behavior or stop unwanted behavior and this is supported by, quote, literally every animal behavior organization on Earth. So the argument here, just to boil it down for everybody, is not that the use of aversives is ineffective. 
It's that it is not necessary. Uh, and further, that in this case, not only is it not necessary, but that this is not controversial among behaviorists. Uh, in fact, it is a brand new scientific consensus. So, Steph, we have germ theory of disease, we have the theory of gravity, and now we have <laughs> the non-aversive theory of dog training. Case closed, the science is settled. Am yeah. I right? That is, I don't even know why anybody would say that. It's such a massive statement. Uh, it's 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 actually a very dangerous statement because it's a big statement and it takes in everybody, and that's certainly not true. And I want to talk about some of the some of the weeds today about why that's actually not the case. And I gotta say, in his in his defense, from his perspective, if you just went out there and did you know like a Google search, you know, Doctor Google you might be very well led to the same conclusions. You know what I mean? On the surface, it kind of does look like that. And I know that Zach had listed a bunch of these um, organizations that he said that are all on board. But when I, and I just quickly took a look at, uh, at, at that list, didn't go through all of them, obviously, but there were a few, most of them looked to me like they were like veterinary associations, right? Like boards and associations. So I want to talk about that one thing first of all is the veterinary associations that have taken the position that that's the case obviously veterinarians love them i work with them every day but i have to question why are the veterinarians suddenly the authority on training tools and on dog training when that's not what they do on a daily basis right like Again, not I'm not poo-pooing vets. They, everybody has their field, right? The important thing is, I think the only people who should be authorities on anything are people who have experience with that thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I mean, call me crazy. That just seems logical to me. Um, I'm not understanding why they're suddenly taking this position and being the authority for that. And I think part of that is just there's this public perception from people who think that anything to do with animals oh we got to go to the vet right like I want to I want to talk about nutrition I'm going to ask my vet right mm. but they're not nutritionists I want to talk about behavior I'm going to talk about my vet and so one of the sort of the analogies and bear with me I love using analogies is like if you had let's say bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or you know severe clinical depression or whatnot your family doctor isn't going to be able to help you with that. They're not, they're not equipped to treat that. What your family doctor is going to do is refer you to a psychiatrist, for example, or a psychotherapist, or someone who actually has training to deal with that one thing. So the Zach doctors George are too, would, yeah. Right here, Zach George would likely say, well, that's the uh, behavioral veterinarian. Yeah, there's not enough behavioral <laughs> veterinarians, and I don't think there's enough depth in there to be able to speak to that. And again, I would challenge him to go back to how many of those behavioral veterinarians are dealing with and have experience with the tools that they're talking about and taking a position on. Part of the problem is a lot of people, professionals, take a certain position on something that they haven't had experience with, but they haven't had experience with it, and they refuse to have experience with it based on the fundamental value that they think it's already bad. Do you know what I mean? It's like- Yeah, they've emotionally it's, reasoned themselves into the position and then they find reasons to justify that position. Yeah, you I'm know? Like. But here's right? the thing, it's like, they are, I mean, they're basing their, their position on something. And, you know, there are countless, according to the, the Force Free Pure Positive side, countless studies new studies studies yeah uh, right and studies. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that and i want to hear your thoughts on that but you know these veterinary um organizations and uh and i guess veterinary behavioral organizations and there were some pet dog trainer organizations and so on they're basing their positions on something and it is these studies so mm -hmm. why are mm -hmm. they going to do that okay and that's weird because the, that profession they're not the ones that mm -hmm. are actually doing the studies mm -hmm. which in itself is not correct okay so I, zach was talking about like this huge body of literature 
of studies that have this, you know, nailed down. And and when you dig a little bit deeper into the studies that he's talking about, most of them are actually not research trials. They're not legitimate studies. They're they're surveys. And again, I'm not going to poo-poo surveys. They're very useful. I actually did one myself last year. Surveys have a place um, in, in research and to help us understand and get more information on a topic, but there's certainly limited value in what you can get out of a survey. A survey, well, a just to say, a yeah, survey so a survey is a survey. A survey is not a research trial. So we're going to talk about what those are. Okay. So we literally are talking so, about a survey here, like a list of questions that is given to someone and someone, there's no like fancy scientific definition of a survey. This is the kind of survey that everyone listening to this will have taken at one point or another. We, I mean, there's, I mean, there's obviously different there's, types, there's of, there's different it, types but... of surveys, right? And there's ways sure. to make surveys more useful or not. But for the most part, the, the critical component of a survey is it's a questionnaire, right. right? You're giving it out to people and they're asking people to fill out what their beliefs are based on a question. And we can talk about the way something's questioned and the way something's worded in a question absolutely can affect the way you answer that survey. Um, but they'll typically you'll see things like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna give a survey out to like a hundred different dog owners, right? And you're gonna ask the owner on a scale of one to ten, you know, or one to five or whatever, and they actually have one, two, three, four, there's whole numbers. They ask people to circle a number, right? They're like on a scale of one to ten, you know, how much how fearful do you think your dog is after this type of training or that type of training or whatever, right? you're physically forced to circle a whole number based on your perception that day. I will guarantee you, and one of my colleagues is actually, no kidding, an expert on survey design <laughs> out of Purdue. Um, really interesting, the conversations with her because she's talked about how difficult it is to get consistency in surveys. You can ask somebody to like, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how fearful do you think your dog is after you completed this training? They'll be like, ah. I think eh, maybe it's about a seven. You can ask that same guy the same question like a week later and he'll probably go with like an eight or like a set, you know, or a six. It's it, it, it's quite likely going to change depending on the day, whether or not he had lunch, um, how he's feeling that day. He may not remember what he, you know what I mean? Like it's not a hard and fast, it's, it's a score based on a subjective feeling and it's likely to change. Now, imagine that, and you give that survey to 100 different dog owners, right? Every dog owner has a different type of dog, different age of dog, different breed of dog. Some may have adopted like a 10-year-old dog from a shelter. Somebody else bought a dog at an eight-week-old, you know, baby puppy from a breeder. Huge amount of variability. There's like a gazillion variables, a gazillion variables. Somebody living in a, in a condo, somebody lives, you know, in suburbia, you know, huge amount of variable that creates so much noise there's absolutely no way to filter that out and there's no way to actually control for that okay so, so as I, people i, I want to just cut you off quickly here because yeah. the biggest defense that we ever hear you know this whole thing of pointing out they're not studies they're surveys we're not the first people to do that that's like a pretty common argument sure. against this um and and so the defense that that the pure positive side will give was that no in fact surveys are actually an excellent source of information they can filter out noise and they have the ability to actually get us to some real data points um so no. are you saying that, that <laughs> is simply an incorrect understanding of yeah of surveys because surveys they give us they give us insight certainly they give us really important insight they give us trends and sort of the lay of the land on how people feel about a certain thing but what's important is we should be taking the information and the insight from those surveys and then digging deeper and investigating what we learn from the survey in a controlled research trial, which is completely different because trial. Okay. So let's go. How back would to you surveys. design that? Tell us about. So, okay, like so let's talk there. about the difference here. Okay. So a lot of times surveys will give us, um, they'll give us correlations. Okay, so it'll be like, okay, maybe the use of this device uh, is highly correlated with that fear, let's say, or whatever it happens to be, right? Correlation 
is an association. And sometimes you can get what's called a spurious, spurious correlation. So I'll give you an example of what a spurious correlation is, like a ridiculous spurious correlation. You might say, okay, summertime is correlated with higher levels of murder. You can't possibly say that summertime causes murders, right? That's ludicrous. However, and but that's what's happening in the dog, you know, training craziness that's going on right now what's going on is there's a just because you have a correlation doesn't mean it's causative so a spurious correlation is basically when you have two variables that are associated together but the association is not based on causality okay um this and the same thing is like well you know did you know summertime is also also associated with increased levels of like ice cream consumption right so what's happening if we go back to that crazy murder scenario is okay well maybe because summertime there's an increase in warm weather okay warm weather tends to draw people out of their houses more people out of their houses causes more traffic foot traffic that increases your you know propensity for people to have altercations higher altercations might have a higher propensity for maybe a murder do you know what i mean like there's a so fourth, many fifth, variables order effect yeah it's not it's out. not this cause that mm. in order to get this cause that the only way to know that is through a controlled research trial so a controlled research trial means you take at least two groups um, of participants dogs in this case any type of animal or people you assign them to a group a category generally a control group and then some sort of treatment group at the very basic okay both groups are treated exactly the same we filtered out all the variables everything is treated the same the environment's the same the food is the same everything's the same the only thing that's different is the one variable that we're interested in that way if there's actual changes we know where that's coming from that's very hard to do. Okay. And so, and, and so I actually asked myself that question. It's like, okay, so we know, we know there's issues with surveys and the amount of reliable information that we can get from it. So I asked myself, I'm like, why is there such a preponderance of surveys? Like, why is that? There's actually quite a few reasons for that. Um, to do an actual research trial with dogs is actually quite difficult dog if you want to work with dogs there's a natural sort of conundrum there that most people don't realize it's not like working with uh you know mice or rabbits or guinea pigs or fish for example which are incredible for genetic research you can actually house you know like 500 mice you know, in a laboratory downstairs in the basement of, of a research facility easily, right? Divide them into groups. You can have 250 mice in a control group, 250 mice on a certain maybe drug or medication. You treat everybody exactly the same. The lighting's the same. The schedule's the same. The circadian rhythm's the same. The diet's the same. Their housing's the same. The only difference is, you know, the drug that they're on or the placebo that they're not on, whatever, right? It gives you an easy way to filter out where the effects are coming from. If I, if I said, you know, today, you know, I want to do a trial and I need 500 newborn, you know, baby mice of a particular genetic line and I need them by like September 1st, that is conceivably very possible, right? Like I can put in an application, submit that as a researcher, whatever. It's, it's perfectly possible to get 500 newborn baby mice. And let's say I want newborn baby mice because it's, maybe there's a behavioral component to it and I want to make sure I get like little little newborn so that it's a you know they're blank slates right so they don't have all these uh environmental yeah, experiences right. you know yeah I, i'm getting you know fresh you know, fresh babies right so i know exactly what's going to happen to them i can do that with fish i can do that with mice i can do that with rats can you imagine if i said i wanted 500 you know newborn baby puppies it ain't gonna happen like it's it's and there's there's a bunch of reasons why that's the case but there's even from things like practical like facility there's no way you're gonna get 500 dogs in a research facility at a university to be able to do this i mean there's 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 a whole practical 
you know, aspect of it, like space, there's money, there's a whole bunch of things. But, so let's, but take a, let's say it was a smaller number. What issues do we run up? Let's say that the, the constraint wasn't money and space and what have you. It's a smaller manageable number. What issues are we running up against? So like I said, research on dogs and cats uh, and primates in particular are actually very, very difficult, restrictive in that, let's say if you have a a researcher who wanted to do whatever it happens to be um, on dogs, you have to, for whatever research facility, whatever university, there's actually something called an ACC in the Animal Care Committee, which is basically the governing ethics board, if you will. And I served on one of those for three years for, for our university here. And what that is, is, is a committee of people who review and they read the in entire experimental protocol. How many animals are you gonna use? What are you gonna do with them? What is the goal? Um, why are you doing this? And there's something called like categories of invasiveness, okay? So our national governing um, guidelines standards are governed by the CCAC, which is Canadian Council on Animal Care. And they write something called the levels of invasiveness. It goes from A to E. So if you're going to do an experiment, if you're submitting for an experiment for approval on any animal at all, just if you just touch an animal, you're automatically in a category B. A would be like if you're working with cell cultures uh, or like tissues, basically not live animals. As soon as you use a live animal, I'm, and I'm talking about just even videotaping them, okay, you're in a, you're in a category B. If you're going to do anything that's going to cause them short-term stress, and there's all the categories with all the requirements in there, you're going to be bumped up to a level C. And then there's DME. So things like, you know, if it's terminal, the experiment and, and you got to like harvest organs and it's, it's, a, it's a terminal thing, that's going to be like the, the highest level of invasives in it would be an E. With dogs, it's very hard to do anything with them because the, the type of care that's given to dogs rather than like, let's say mice and zebrafish, they have um, like students, for example, that come in that are volunteers that come in, walk them play with them they're given a, a certain amount of enrichment there's there's a high level of um, structure around the use of dogs in a, in a in a laboratory environment right they're very very careful with what you do with those dogs they're a limited number uh, they're high value animals they're very hard to work with because their needs are are very high so what are the consequences of this on our understanding of the use of aversives, right? So, so we're talking a lot about sure. the difficulties in, in actually getting the data. The pushback that I, that I can hear coming is that, okay, Dr. Steph, you're telling me all of this stuff about how hard it is to actually do these studies in the first mm -hmm. place. What you're really saying is that you don't have the data. We do. We have the surveys. All you're right. doing is you're telling me we don't have the studies. So, right. so how do we, like, what is the source of truth here? How do we know how to approach this? So, I mean, and there's other reasons why it makes it harder um, to do real research trials. But to your point, the answer there is that you're right. We actually have a void in really good controlled research trials on the use of aversive tools. You're absolutely right. There isn't enough of a volume uh, and body of research there. There just isn't. That's is this why specifically we have on dogs or on any animal. Oh no, this is. I'm talking about dogs. Right. Like if okay. you wanted, if you wanted research on on punishment, positive punishment, uh, and aversives and whatever in mice, my God, there's like, I don't know, half a million published papers of really good quality from like 1950 psychology journals. Like, there's tons of that. We're talking about dogs, and this is why they're very unique. This is what I'm trying to say. They're very unique. It's hard to do that type of research that we were able to do back in the 50s with mice that we can't do now. Do you know what I mean? It's really hard. And there's even issues like funding. If you don't get the funding, you're not getting that research trial done. And we're talking like just the most basic behavioral research because behavior research is very, very difficult. It's not like running a drug trial where you can just give them a pill or not give them a pill. Behavior requires hundreds of hours of videotape, 
hundreds of hours of behavioral coding for someone who actually understands what to look for, body posture, all that type of thing, is very expensive. It's easy to rack up like a hundred grand, 200 grand on, on, on a very basic behavioral trial. It's very expensive. So if I said today, you know, I wanted to go run a trial, I'd have to apply for funding. But let's be honest, like, let's have an honest discussion here. It's like, if you were on the funding board and you're on the committee to dole it, you've got a pot of money, right, for the entire nation, and you get applications from all these research trials, how likely are you going to be to dole out a hundred grand to somebody who says, I want to look at, you know, the effects of shot callers versus you get like another submission that comes into you that says i want to look at you know the best way to use treats to get a dog to sniff out cancer like boom i mean it's a no-brainer do you know what i mean and don't forget when you dole out funding as a funding agency you get reviewed too you have to you have to justify why you spent that money for that type of trial i also want to talk to you about publishing too and this is a, it's a personal little tidbit and it happened and it's crazy. Like five years ago, I had con contacted um, three different um, magazines. It was like dog training magazines and one actual uh, journal, like a, it was like an animal behavior type, you know, peer reviewed journal. And the editors of all four of them, I had asked them if they're interested in having some sort of article that opens up the conversation and discussion about the, the use of different tools and the effect they have on the efficacy of training. And I got shot down by all four of them. And this is what they told me. They said that they weren't interested in having that type of article because it didn't align with the values of their readership. I, w I just blew my mind. I'm like, are you kidding me? It didn't align with the values of the readership and one particular um, magazine. It was supposed to be like more, you know, sciencey nature type magazine. So that's why I chose them. And the editor said that they didn't want to offend their readers. And I'm like, is this about <laughs> offending readers or is it about sharing facts and having an honest conversation and actually being scientifically minded, which is to be curious and to figure out what works and doesn't work. And if it doesn't, and it challenges our paradigm, then maybe we need to shift and maybe we need to reevaluate and figure out what is the truth. They didn't even want to go there. I, I was really disappointed in humanity that day. Like I, I couldn't believe they said, well, we don't want to offend a readership. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Um, that happened. That actually happened. I 100% believe that that happened. Uh, I want to just, <laughs> I want to, I, I want to just kind of get back to the discussion of how do we know what to believe? And so we have at this point, uh, we've I think it very effectively shown that the surveys that have been done, and I have to think there is some element of not wanting to offend readership when it comes to the design of surveys as well. Um, but we have uh, effectively explained why those surveys are not effective to give us actionable information in this space. You have explained that there is a void of uh, exper uh, experimental research in this space on dogs specifically. Mm -hmm. um, there were is, a few. Is it valid for us to import our understanding of aversives and positive punishment from other species and the research that's been done on other species two dogs well yes and no right it's never just a yes and no but and, and so this takes me to your question takes me to a statement that zach said on one of his videos where he said well i've looked into the research um and all the studies have shown that the use of punishment has um long lasting um and sometimes permanent negative effects now, I don't know what studies he's talking about, let, but I'll give him this. Let's just say he actually did find those studies. And my, my, this is my guess. So, Zach, if you're watching, I totally invite you to share that literature with me because I'd love to see it, what he's talking about. But my, my best guess is that if it truly were studies, he's probably referring to 
like old school 1950s and by old school I'm not poo-pooing I'm saying those are the classic stuff right classic stuff from like 1950s psychology early early stuff done on like shocking mice or shocking dogs into a space of you know learned helplessness and people love to talk about that that's absolutely true if you do take an animal and you punish them chronically for no reason in for a way no reason and and you can't and the animal has no control over what's happening to itself, right? No ability to escape the aversive um, punishment. Yeah, they're going to develop some really deleterious consequences. They succumb to apathy. They succumb to anhedonia, which means they can't feel pleasure anymore. They basically are, are broken in lay terms, right? Totally, that totally affect, that totally happens. That's not applicable to this conversation. That's not what we're doing dogs. Nobody's putting dogs into cages and shocking the hell out of them, not giving them the ability to get away with that, right? That's a completely different conversation. So to extract that kind of data, you know, and it's, and it's truthful what he said, but taking it out of context makes it completely dangerous, right? it's like taking somebody's interview like an hour interview and they say you know part of a sentence and you cut that five seconds out oh, and it makes it sound that, like they said happen. something you know you know it's like you can't do that like if you take it out of context then it completely changes the entire conclusion and I, I and I fear that's what he's done right because so let, let's talk about animal behavior Let, let's talk about behavior um right now that actually does happen right so i think a lot of people get really upset about well we don't want to positively punish an animal because we don't want to cause any deleterious consequences that have long-term effects right obviously nobody wants that right the the biggest um the biggest factor in that like that we've learned from animal behavior in general across all species is when an animal is chronically stressed randomly they do suffer negative consequences, but when they can anticipate when something's going to happen and they have control over what's going to happen to themselves, that doesn't happen. The stress actually goes away. So there was there's a there's a study that I read on mice where they took you know two two different groups of mice and what they did was they put a, a mild stressor on them. Well, they called it mild, but what they would do is actually, you know, mice like to build little burrows and little, little nests and they sleep in that at night. What they would do is they would bust down their nest. And well, what happens, they rebuild the nest, but they kept busting down the nest and then, and they would actually, um, they would spin the cage, which is obviously very stressful. Imagine sitting in your house and everything starts spinning, right? They did that every day for this group of mice, every day at the same time at like eight o'clock in the morning. They did the same thing to this other group of mice. The only difference, they would bust down their, their, their nest and they would spin uh, the cage for like 10 seconds or something like that. The only difference is for this group of mice, they did it randomly throughout the day. Could be in the middle of the night, they could be sleeping, could be 12 o'clock noon. They, there was absolutely no way those mice could anticipate that when that was gonna happen. They found that the two groups had completely different stress responses. These mice were so chronically stressed, they had high, 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 high levels of cortisol relative to these guys and their adrenal glands were like, you know, off the chart. And so what's interesting from that study is that it's not the actual stimulus, it's the fact that they couldn't anticipate it that had such a huge difference in their response. And to take that further, it's like when you give an animal the ability to control its environment, so it's like a dog when we teach pressure, for example, if they know how to turn that pressure off, they have complete control. Any type of response, you know, uh, stress response that we see, it goes away. It doesn't stay there indefinitely. And that's the thing. That's another thing that there's a void in the, in the scientific literature is longitudinal studies. There are, in fact, a few studies I think I only found Define two. longitudinal studies for us. Longitudinal study is like literally, so we look at whatever variable we apply. So here it might be the use of e-collars for training or, or whatever it is, right? Most of the studies, and I, honestly, I think there's like two that I found that's an actual research trial. The only, so there's like all this surveys and then there's like this much when it comes to research trial. Those research trials that I've read, and I swear to God, I've only been able to find like two to three. They're not well done because they didn't use the e-collar in the proper way. They used it to train a new behavior, which is insane. 
Like, why, why would you do that? Like, if the way that the experiment was set up was like doomed for failure to begin with, because they weren't using the e collar in the appropriate manner. You know, like it was. I set want to up get to into fail. that. That's actually. I don't want you to jump too far ahead there because okay. that's. We're, we're going to get into the actual specific training applications. Um, so let's just pause that for for a longitudinal. Second. Okay. Long, so light, longitudinal. Long. Those studies looked at the actual training procedure. They're like, how much stress and distress does this particular act? cause the animal right so they're looking at the dog that oh we see lip licking you know we see the ears pinned back or you know we see that i'm starting to pull away whatever it is it's like absolutely right that happened and you didn't see that um in the control group that was positive only nobody disputes that right but then they the experiment ends there and the conclusions were drawn on that snapshot so the stress you need to do in the moment, the way yeah. we feel stress if we were so like, oh, it really stressed out the animals. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not that's not rocket science, right? What we need to do to actually get to the bottom of it is watch the movie, not just watch a still shot. And I think that's what's happening with the few research trials we're out there is they're taking a still shot. They're like, oh my god, this is what happened. Like the dogs were stressed out. They didn't follow. The quality of life, and this is where animal welfare science comes in. Animal welfare science is about measuring the quality of life. Life, not the quality of the moment. It's what's the quality of life, right? So nobody bothered to follow up on these dogs like, you know, a month later, six months later, or a year later. Because I can bet you if it's done properly, a year later, most owners are going to say, yeah, that, you know, 30 seconds where his ears were pinned back the first time I used an e-collar on him, he doesn't do that anymore. Now his quality of life has increased because he can go off leash, we can go swimming, I can take him to the, you know, um, camping and he's part of our life and we have a much better quality of life with the dog or, the, you know, our relationship is better. Nobody ever bothers to follow them across time. Right. It, we're, I think we're, we've just been subject to the snapshot problem. Is there and so a, I would encourage anyone that's doing new research to follow through and follow up on how these dogs are doing post training, because it's not the same as what happens at the time. Is there a benefit to exposing animals to stress and teaching them to work through it? Absolutely. Well, here, here's the thing about stress in general. And again, animal welfare is not about how do we just like not put any stress on them at all? Because again, that's not, it, it doesn't contribute to our understanding of the quality of life, right? So I, I would think that most people would agree that dogs hate, hate going to the veterinarian. They freaking hate it. You drive into that parking lot and they're starting to freak out already because every time they go to the vet, they get poked and prodded and blood drawn and whatnot. They hate it. You know, I've seen dogs with their legs spread out trying to like not get through the door. They're showing huge amounts of stress, huge amounts of fear. But we as a society accept that and go, well, that's a necessary stress because I need the dog to get vaccinated or I need to get some diagnostics on him so that we can figure out how to make sure he doesn't get sick or how to treat whatever that he has for the longer term. Nobody, uh, we all accept that stress. We all accept that fear. We all accept that because we're thinking about the longer term. Why are we not using that concept for something like training, which has long-term uh, effects and that's going to affect our quality of life for the next, you know, 12, 14 years, right? So you've hit on training and I want to use that as a segue into the next part of, of our discussion here. And that, you know, I'm, I mentioned in the beginning that the argument here is not that uh, aversives don't work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in one of, of Zach George's videos, in fact, he acknowledges that they work and acknowledges that they work quickly, um, mm -hmm. which I would equate with efficiently. Um, right, and right. So it's not that they don't work. It's that they are never necessary. Okay. And so when I when I break down that argument and I try to understand, okay, what does, what does never necessary really mean? 
at mm -hmm. the end of the day, what that boils down to is what you as a dog trainer deem to be a trained dog. Because exactly. So in my I training, I believe that they are always necessary, just not always <laughs> necessary all the time, but they are right. necessary to get the dog to the level of training that I deem to be appropriate. Can I get mm -hmm. a dog to a lower level of training without using them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so I think that there's a bit of a disconnect in what is a trained dog. So I yes. want to I, I get into that a little bit with you and what does it mean to actually apply this to a training scenario? And I also then want to get into a little bit of the discussion that, that has been had online about, you know, positive reinforcement for bears, for blood draws and things mm -hmm. like that lines mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get to that question after but i i, I want i want to address that so, so i mean i mean the training dogs first of all so okay and and i'm glad you brought that up because i was thinking about that exact same thing and i think this whole uh online war can honestly be ended if we figure out what our operational definitions are and i'm and I, I wanted to talk about operational definitions actually at the beginning because i think it's really the crux of the matter so there's a research term called operational definition and what that means is before you engage in any type of research or any type of whatever you should come up with what's called an operational definition which means you define exactly what you're measuring and how to measure that variable, right? So, so if you read some really you know, good ethology papers at the very, somewhere closer to the top, you know, around the materials and methods, you'll often find like a table with operational definitions. It's basically like a glossary of terms, right? It'll be like you know, sit, what, what, what is a sit, right? So, but on the ground, head up, whatever. They just have to define it very clearly, crystal clear, so that you and I and every reader who picks up that paper understands what is meant by that term. I think the issue that we're having right now is that what you or or I or you know Ivan or Robert considers a trained dog is not what Zach considers a trained dog. And I mean, I did hear him say this in one of his videos to your point is he said oh well what happens if i have like a a dinner party and my dog's freaking out while you know guests are arriving for 20 minutes he goes let him freak out for 20 minutes let him freak out and he said and when he calms down reward him for the fact that he calmed down and i'm like holy crap i'll tell you that i would not tolerate my dogs flipping out for 20 minutes because we're not having a dinner party because guests are going to leave probably injured because we have 100 pound dogs jumping in their face i don't let so my this is exactly i wouldn't want my guests doing it I, <laughs> why am i okay so why, with my dog doing it but that's exactly it so operational definition i mm -hmm. think what it would come down to is that we said hey zach what's your operational definition of a recall so for me let's just throw it out there and say okay when i utter the word come He's got seven seconds from 100 meters to come directly to my seat with his face looking at me, right? What, whatever that definition is. And he's not allowed to meander, okay? Um, he has to come direct. He has to be able to do it under distraction. He has to be able to do it inside, outside, whatever. And then you write that down. These are the requirements. This is the operational def uh, definition of a recall, right? This is so important. And this is never put into the research um, trials and papers that are published nobody actually there was one that actually defined what they meant by certain things which was super cool love that but they didn't they didn't talk about how the e-collar was done I'd love to see research that like defines everything properly so that everybody readers and researchers and trainers alike can pick up the paper and everybody's comparing apples to apples we're not comparing apples to apples we're comparing apples to oranges because maybe if we ask Zach hey what what it what is a recall for you? He might say, I'm gonna utter the word come. And the dog has like, you know, 15 minutes where he's allowed to sort of come to me and then take like a turn and then like sniff at that bush and then piss on that tree and then like, you know, 10 minutes later ends up at my feet, right? He might consider that that's a recall. And this is why we're like arguing from 
this is the argument's going to go on until the cows come home because we're not agreeing on the definition. If we can both agree what a recall looks like, if we can agree what a good, you know, don't bite me looks like, right? with all the requirements and then say, can we meet that with the positive only and with balanced training? That's where you're going to see the conclusions coming about is they're not the same. They're so not. I would say they are operational there. definitions. Let's talk. Let's talk recall for a second. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about uh, the difference between training a new behavior and mm -hmm. stopping an unwanted behavior. Mm -hmm. And in this case, let's say the unwanted behavior is uh, is just blowing you off on the recall, right? Right. Uh, so um, they will say, uh, look, I can get as strong a recall as you can any day of the week using nothing but <clears throat> and love. I'm going to just pay my dog and pay my dog and pay my dog. And that dog right. is going to know that when it comes to me, it gets paid. And all that dog is ever going to care about is getting paid by whatever I have to pay that dog with, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's the argument. And and there's the, you're not getting anything better than I am by using and that's the fallacy. Shop collars and prong collars and all your meanie toys. And, and that's the fallacy, right? In, in behavior in real life, <clears throat> dogs are sentient beings like we are, and their emotions are in flux. They change every minute, every hour, every day, right? So what's uh, what's desirable, like that piece of chicken in your quiet living room that's highly valued, right? At one point becomes devalued as soon as you go outside. And, that, and that's one of the biggest fallacies is that you always have something to offer the dog that it wants more than the thing that it's going for. And that's absolutely not true. Because if your dog sees a squirrel, boom, he's out of there. He's not looking back at you. He's not engaging. There's nothing you can do. But I just called my point. dog off a squirrel and I don't have an e-collar and I did it yeah. one time. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that comes down to operational definitions. I would ask anybody, what do you consider a recall? So for me, like what's considered success? What does success look like for you, right? So if I say a successful recall, and this is important if we're going to do research and we're going to do experiments. You have to define everything. You have to put out the requirements. So if we say the dog was trained, for me, that's like, let's just say we're going to ask the dog to do this 100 times. He's going to do it according to the requirements, 99 out of 100 times. That's a pass. If Zach says, I only require him to do this 60 out of 100 times, if your level of compliance is set at 60%, that's not the same thing as our level of compliance at 99%. They're two very different metrics. So again, it comes down to what is acceptable? What is, you totally nailed it. It's like, what is the definition of a trained dog? And that's why we're having this argument right here, because a lot of these other trainers allow for a huge amount of disobedience, a huge amount of variability right? So it's, it's just about where do you want to set your bar? And how do you want to define it? Definitions matter, words matter. And I don't think that we're, we're communicating effectively as a community. And I, and I think that's going to help out a lot if we can start putting definitions on things. I think it's also really important for people to understand that the fact that you know, there, look, there are people out there who have called their dog off a squirrel and they've never used an e-collar or a prong collar. And there are dogs that you can sure. like no one is disputing that that is a, a possibility or even a likelihood. What I'm saying is in the event that that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. I still 100 percent of the time need to have the ability to get my dog back to me. And his argument will be, well, just keep your dog on a long line all the time. And now again, we get back into definitions. What is it properly trained? Correct. It all Correct. boils back down to those definitions. To me, I don't want my dog on a long line all the time. I live in the forest. Yeah. Uh, I have my dog on a long line all the time. All I'm doing is unwinding a long line from trees and bushes. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that doesn't work for me. Um, right. For a lot of people, that doesn't work, right? Exactly. Um, and so... <clears throat> I, I want to just kind of, uh, I want to talk a little bit about 
the the discussion that's being had around uh, these the, the the bears. The, there's these four mm -hmm. captive bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that were trained using nothing but but pure positive mm -hmm. um, reinforcement in order to accept blood draws. Now, yeah. the stipulation I'll put on this is that these are captive bears. Um, right. I, I would love to watch the live stream of the people who try to do this experiment on wild grizzly bears. <laughs> Sell that shit on pay-per-view. Um, but... And anyway, all that being said, tell me about the difference between <clears throat> wild and captive animals, how that applies to the differences in personality <laughs> that we see among dogs. I mean, all dogs are domesticated animals. It doesn't mean yeah. they're all equally Jeanette... easy to train. Um, and so so talk to me a little bit about those differences and, and where that analogy might fall short. Okay, so we can talk about genetics actually in a, in a little bit, but I do want to go back to the bears offering their arm up for blood draws. So a friend of mine, um, she actually works at the Metro Toronto Zoo and she has in fact done that uh, with panda bears, uh, which is amazing. It's awesome. Nobody's debating that not having to tranquilize an animal and having them voluntarily do this is, is a good thing. Absolutely nobody's debating that. What's interesting is when I when I talk to her about that, she says, oh, yeah, you know, there are, cer there are certain animals that they've trained to be able to do that. There are still animals of the same species and whatever herd they're dealing with where that doesn't work. They still have to resort to a tranquilizer. For example, they put it in a piece of food. Nobody's darting them. You know what I mean? But it really just shows the, the, the difference um, in variation of temperament in animals. Do they actually train their animals to put their arms through and, and voluntarily do blood trial? Yes, they do. But there's also animals where it doesn't work. It's not for the lack of trying. They still actually, so they do it for some animals, they don't do it for others because there is natural variation. That's what biology is about. It's, it's a very dangerous, dangerous thing for people to say that that there's no difference. It's like, it's all you, right? It's it's all in how you train them. It's, it's simply not true. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, it's literally a biological fact that there are huge genetic differences and it, it does change the temperament. Does training matter? Absolutely, but there's not, I'm tired of this like nature versus nurture debate. Like, is it nature, is it nurture? It's both. It's mm -hmm. always both. It always has been both and it always will be both. And it's about managing both nature and nurture to the best of your ability with knowledge and facts to get what it is that you're you're looking for. So, so it I matters. Really, I want to be really um, careful here that we're not, and I think from a previous discussion, it's pretty clear, but um, you know, there's been some discussion and and the question has often come up to say like, Okay, well, what do you do then when all the pure positive work fails, right? As if uh, positive punishment is is only a fallback, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want to be I want to be super clear that there are instances like you're talking about right now where positive reward may be in effect. Like there's dogs out there that couldn't care less if you love them or not. Uh, yeah, you know, back George. Yeah. I don't know how many of them he's seen, but they don't care, and they would rather bite you than love you. And it has nothing to do with them being afraid of you. Uh, it has to do with the fact that they just don't want you around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and those dogs are out there, and and they don't want your food. And we would rather that they not have to be put down. So in that mm -hmm. instance, positive punishment can be effective. But look, positive punishment can play an integral role. Integral role in any training program. I think that's the important thing to understand and the important thing that we're trying to get across here. And not only that, um, from everything that you've said, it sounds to me like it actually creates for a more effective training program if your definition is a highly trained dog. Is well, let's go. Well. Okay, so I also want, this makes me think of a, of a bunch of things. Um, biology. 
I just want to talk about biology for two. I just want to bring up the word biology if we're, if we're going to go back to science. Because I know that Zach at one point said, and I think you read it earlier, like nowhere in the natural animal kingdom is, you know, punishment ever necessary, I'll blah, 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 which is completely is false. no known instance right. in the animal kingdom where positive punishment is required Okay. In order to create a new behavior, which we know we don't create new behaviors with right. punishment. Or, we never do that. Or to stop an okay. unwanted behavior. Okay. Can so you one word. A habituated bear from entering a campsite using nothing. <laughs> exactly, else? right? Um, when did biology stop being a science? I I thought of no, seriously, and I, I'm not trying to be cheeky. I just if I'm going to talk to somebody who's this force free and, and, and to that, I just want to direct it to that particular statement, like nowhere in the natural kingdom, right? When did biology stop becoming a science? Because natural biology, all you have to do, it's like, Zach, turn on freaking the discovery channel for Christ's sake, or go outside and look at like feral dogs. Just look at animals. Just have you ever, like, I just want, I'm like, have you ever actually watched animals? The, th the craziest thing to me is when people have become so anthropocentric that we have the gall to say, we know as humans how to better communicate with dogs than dogs know how to communicate with dogs. Let's like take that in for a second. I'm a human and I know how to better communicate with a dog than a dog knows how to communicate with a dog. That's insane. That's not even logical and it's not biologically based. If you if you look at animals in natural biology, it's like have you watched a mother dog discipline her puppy? But we're not their mother, Steph. You know what I mean? That's the, that's the counter argument, Steph. Right? We are not their mother. It's not our place to interact right. with a dog like But it's about learning how to communicate. Should we not look to how dogs communicate with other dogs using nature as guidance as to the best strategy on how we should right like a mother dog is not going to let her puppy bite at her nipples for 20 minutes and step all over her she's going to shut that down she's going to discipline that puppy right away fairly in a way that's effective and that's through twenty thousand years of existence is the way that dogs communicate with other dogs should we should we not be so narcissistic as humans go oh maybe dogs know how to communicate with each other maybe we should learn from dogs right? When did biology stop becoming a science? That's, that's the question I'd like to ask, right? It's a real science. Learn from it. Like we need to step back and observe and like not be so terrified of having to shift our paradigm. Like I think it comes down to human ego after a certain point, right? I, so biology. I delve into this discussion, the more it seems extremely clear that what it all boils down to, right? When when you see these discussions happening online and, and the pure positive point is put, put forward and then there's a really good retort from someone on, on the balanced side um, and it goes back and forth a bit. And, and at the end of the day, the, the what it always boils down to is, well, I can't have this debate with someone who's willing to inflict pain on an animal in order to mm -hmm. simply to gain compliance from that animal. Mm -hmm. It is, it's unethical, it's wrong. No, you can tell me everything that you want to tell me. At the end of the day, I don't want to hurt my dog. How do mm -hmm. you Well, I have actually a perfect example of it and it's, and it's, it's, a unfortunately a true story with a friend who had a couple of shih tzus and this happened I don't know, maybe about four years ago we we're at their place she opened the door and we had lots of lots of discussions about you know training and she did not want to use any type of aversive tools at all and she had a terrible recall basically no recall on her dog opened the door ran out they actually live on a street that's it comes right off of the main 401 highway. And she watched her dog run out onto the street 
as she called and called her called, her name was Tara. She kept it Tara, 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 Tara. She ran out and she watched her dog get smushed and painted the ground and the and and the street with her dog. The amount of trauma this poor woman had having to witness her dog literally be smashed to bits with that blood on that road for over a week because it didn't rain, had to see that every single day and be reminded that her dog literally got smashed by a tractor trailer because we have a lot where we live. I would challenge anybody to say, do you want to hurt your dog? Because that's exactly what happened. And that happened in the most hideous way and most traumatic way in the most painful way, if she had actually had an e-collar on that dog, just give it like a 0.5 millisecond stim, that dog would be alive today. And Instead, she had, she had conditioned that dog on ahead of time. We should. Yeah, we should for sure. That. For sure. It's not See a, a professional. For dogs. Um, for sure. But, yeah. Yeah, no, totally, totally preface that for sure. If she had proper training on that dog, mm. she would not have to witness her Shih Tzu being smushed onto the ground and 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 literally hideously killed by a tractor trailer right so when people ask like do i want to hurt my dog i'm like do you want to hurt your dog because i've seen a lot of hurt goes back to taking your dog to the vet they don't like it they don't like getting vaccinations they don't like being handled by the vet causes them a lot of fear nobody ever questions that that is a necessary stress and yet we do it we need to start taking that concept and applying it to training because it is necessary but again that's the matter I think is, your dog we'll is finish gonna, this yeah your dog is going to encounter stressful situations for sure of life right part of teaching the dog with aversives is training the dog to actually work and think through some of that momentary stress that the dog is under that training of simply being able to work through the stress then goes on to apply to different areas of the dog's life. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important that we all kind of keep that in mind. I think we here have covered, we've, we've uh, retread some old ground, certainly. I think we've covered uh, a bunch of new ground. But I want to give you a chance, Steph, um, to, to, you know, I'm going to open the floor. What have I not asked you? What do people need to know before we wrap this conversation? Is there anything else that we need to talk about before we go? Um, not really, other than the fact that I would just like to say that when Zach said that, you know, the scientific community has reached a consensus, he would make you believe that it's a lot simpler than it actually is and it's not it's not they're just it, it, it's it's a false statement right like from things like numerically getting enough sample size to funding to ethics boards to you know surveys to not designing an experiment properly to having you know experiments doomed for failure from the gecko because they weren't using it right those things matter right those things underneath matter to the overall conclusion and i would say if if he had known about these other things that we talked about today about you know having a research trial actually created and run to the end and published um maybe he wouldn't be so quick to jump to the conclusion that there's there's a con consensus because because there really isn't I think that's a pretty good statement to wrap on. If people have questions, um, is the best way for them to get a hold of you through the the Black Kraken Instagram page? Yeah, sure. Yeah, would be, be great. Let's have more discussions for sure. And we're not, and we want to just like I invite really, you know, wholeheartedly, authentic, sincerely curious questions. I don't, I don't, I'm just I don't want any conflict. I don't want to argue. I just I really want to help dogs because we love dogs right that's why we're here and we want the best quality of life for them and, it, and we just truly believe that this is the best way to do it that's the bottom line um yeah. so look at black kraken kennels on instagram um we are black kraken kennels on facebook um this video will be up on facebook and youtube um but we have a presence we don't have much of a presence on youtube right now but maybe that'll maybe that'll change um if there are questions, please do reach out. Steph, uh, you know, is is an incredible resource. I can attest to that. Uh, like I said in the beginning, I'm I'm hugely fortunate to have the opportunity to work with someone as 
experience with her in this space. And um, Steph, thanks so much for your time. Thanks. Have a nice Sunday. I'll be watching Super Bowl. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> All right. Bye.